Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Morena everyone, I hope you're having a great week and welcome to Wikipedia. I'm Mickey Willardin, obviously, and this week I sit down and chat to Dr. Ethan Weiss all about his time-restricted eating study that hit the headlines when it came out last year with its almost shocking result, if you like, that there appeared to be no benefit in some areas with time-restricted eating. And, you know, up until this point, time-restricted eating was one of the default methods available to people to see some real results with regards to fat loss, improving metabolic health, maintenance of muscle mass, and a host of other things. You can imagine that for the author of a study that didn't see these clear outcomes, there was going to be a lot of interest in his research. So this is one of the reasons why I wanted to touch base. So Dr. Ethan Weiss is a cardiologist at the University of California, San Francisco, whose special interests include preventative cardiology, the genetics of coronary disease, risk assessment for heart conditions, and heart disease in the young. So in his research, Dr. Weiss uses genetic models to better understand the mechanisms of metabolic disorders linked to heart disease, such as obesity, fatty liver disease, and diabetes. He also studies blood clotting system, seeking to identify novel ways to safely block clots associated with heart attack and stroke without causing an increase in bleeding. Dr. Weiss and I talk about how he got into cardiology, but also how he sort of transitioned from this general model of cardiology to looking at it and looking at nutrition as a tool to help improve metabolic health. And he was in fact invited to sit on the board of a company called Verda Health who use a low carb high fat diet to help improve metabolic health and reverse type 2 diabetes and it was in this space that he went on as an advisory that he started to do some digging into that literature and sort of turned his own knowledge on its head with regards to his opinion on how useful a low carbohydrate high fat diet could be. So we talk a bit about his background there and how it impacted his personal and professional health and then how he was inspired to run this time restricted eating study which was a clinical study called the treat me study that was set with real life conditions and looked at some of these metabolic health muscle mass markers and what actually happened to people over a set period of time if all you did was tell them to restrict their calories. So we do a deep dive into his study, what he did, what he found, what we can say about what he found and then what's next for Dr. Ethan Weiss and his study team. So that's super interesting. And in fact, he alludes to a study that at the time wasn't published, uh, which is now published, which we will link in the, sh in the show notes. And this is just a different take on this time-restricted eating Mediterranean sort of space. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation that I have with Dr. Ethan Weiss. Professor Wythe, Ethan, um, thank you so much for taking time to chat to me today. Um, I'm super excited to chat to you about your, well, a lot to do with your recent research interest in time-restricted eating and some of the findings and the implications from that, but just get a real general sense of where you see this area is right now and, and kind of where it's going. So I understand you're a preventative cardiologist and it's something of a sort of family career, if you like, because your dad is also a preventative cardiologist. Yeah, I don't think my dad would describe himself as a preventive cardiologist. He's a cardiologist. My dad, it just turned 80 in January wow. and he's still practicing full time. Uh, he's on the faculty at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, where I grew yeah. up. Yeah. He's a little bit more of like an imaging um, but i think probably actually his practice now is probably more like mine yeah and was that what inspired you to kind of get into the field ethan 
No, quite the contrary. I actually went to college thinking I wanted to do anything but follow in my dad's footsteps and then sort of <laughs> ended up going to medical school. And the last thing I thought I would do when I went to medical school was to do cardiology. It was yeah. accidental. And so with regards to your your dad's career, I suppose, and your own path, how do they differ? So preventative cardiology, if you're describing that to me, what what are the types of things that you do that might be different from, from how your dad or, or other cardiologists might practice? Right. So, I mean, cardiology has become a lot more complicated since the days when my dad was doing his training, when you yeah. could specialize in a few different sub areas within cardiology. Actually, back then, there probably weren't even any official ones. But yeah. by the time that I got to medical school in the early 1990s, there were several areas you could become an interventional cardiologist with just people who would sort of do angioplasties or now put in stents. There were people who would focus on um, electrical problems in the heart. Like we call them electrophysiologists. Uh, today, there are people who focus on heart failure. Specifically, mm. there are people who focus on imaging, different forms of imaging, whether that's ultrasound or ct or mri there are people who focus on adult congenital i mean you can sort of go through the list preventive cardiology is a relatively recent specialty and i just describe it to people that sort of mostly what we focus on is taking people who i would say the vast majority of my patients are people who are healthy and want to stay healthy yeah Uh, there are i do have a small number of people who fall under that sort of bucket of what we call secondary prevention Mm -hmm. which is people who've already had some sort of incident court cardiovascular disease who then want to not have another problem yeah and ethan has your practice changed over time oh yeah 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 so ethan i understand that you were brought on to an organization verda health as an, an almost an advisory to kind of offer a critical eye or not a critical maybe just a critique to their method to helping people optimize or improve their health outcomes. Can you describe your role in Verda? Um, and I'm not mm. sure if you're still there or not. And then, and then kind of how that might have influenced kind of what you're doing or what you yeah, end up doing. Sure. I guess if you back up, uh, you know, we've long known that there's an association between overweight and obesity and metabolic disease and cardiovascular disease. It's, uh, often hard to untangle that in sort of a really quantitative exact way, but there's no doubt that there, that being overweight or obese is a risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. So mm-hmm. a lot of my patients, understandably, come to me with an interest in wanting to improve their health and particularly to try to lose some weight. Uh, and I would say up until five or six years ago, except for the very extreme cases in whom we would consider something like bariatric surgery, We didn't have a lot to offer uh, other than just sort of the classic sort of try to eat less and exercise more, right? Which doesn't work very well. Mm. Uh, I was introduced to a company called Amada Health. I don't know if you're familiar with Amada, but Amada is a company that was founded probably now seven or eight years ago. They were sort of, their mission is, or initially their mission was to try to uh, enable the diabetes prevention program. So the NIH ran this big trial back in the early 2000s called DPP. And mm-hmm. uh, it was an intensive uh, in-person coaching uh, intervention that helped people kind of improve their nutrition and lose weight. Mm. And it was shown in a big, huge randomized trial that it was effective and it prevented the onset of type 2 diabetes in people who had prediabetes. Mm. Uh, and so that was then eventually sort of rolled out to in-person uh, you know, YMCA's, churches, uh, schools and stuff, people would come in for meetings, much like they would for AA or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so they decided when they were founded, I think it was, like I said, seven, eight years ago, they decided that they were going to try to enable this program virtually using the same ideas, the same coaching and stuff, but they would deliver it all through a smartphone um, yeah. or a web-based platform. And so I got introduced to them, and it was through them that I got introduced to Verda. Uh, oh. And at the time, I was sort of, they were somewhat similar in that they were both going to use technology to try to optimize health and help people lose weight. Uh, and, ver- and the people at Verda, I thought were super smart. I did not back then know that much about low carbohydrate diets. Mm. Uh, and I was probably a little, a little bit skeptical about it, but, but I thought the data that I saw that they were showing me were really impressive. And so I did agree to, to join them as an advisor. I don't exactly know why they wanted me to, to be their advisor, but I did join them and, 
it goes 2017 and I stayed on for a few years and I'm no longer uh, involved with the company. Yeah. So the so the similarities in that they were both using smartphone technology was were, were the methods they were using to help people lose the weight different like with the DPP program was that very much was that a different program to what Verda Health kind of promote? Right. Well, look, uh, there were some th- common threads, right? So yeah. one of the th- common threads I think is that they both provide some level of support and mostly in the form of yeah. coaching. Yeah. Uh, what Verda was doing in terms of actual what do you put in your mouth was mm. very different than what Amada was doing. So Verda, as yeah, you yeah. know, is very focused on low carbohydrates or ketogenic diets. This came from the work of Steve Finney and Jeff Bullock, who were the two yeah. medical co-founders. And so they were trying to operationalize that. They were trying to scale basically Steve Finney's weight loss clinic, mm. get people to be able to do what he was getting his patients to do in person for years, but to do that at scale. Uh, but again, there were some similarities and common threads, I think, between them and any of these weight loss companies that have yeah. come up over the past few years. Yeah. So, Ethan, can you kind of describe, so what was your thought process throughout your, your on the advisory board of Verda Health? You start looking at the data, you start becoming convinced? Yeah, I would say I was very convinced that when it came to the sort of primary things that they were doing, that they were being very successful. Uh, And those two things were getting people to lose weight and also getting people to improve their diabetes. And the thing that I think still to this day is most most impressive about what Verda has demonstrated is is that they're getting people to come off of their diabetes medication. So that obviously one of the major differences between the companies and between the programs is that at the beginning, Verda was very much focused on patients with type 2 diabetes. So mm. they mm. had some who didn't have diabetes, had pre-diabetes, but most of them had diabetes. And so most of them were on a lot of medications and they were getting them to come off. We hadn't seen that happen except for people who got bariatric surgery. Like that just never happens that you would de-escalate medications. You're usually adding yeah. on, adding on, adding on. So that was very impressive. And among at least among the people that they had sort of enrolled in their initial clinical trial, they were able to do it and they were able to do it for a very long period of time. And um, and so that was impre- that was impressive. It's interesting. They um, just published a report here in New Zealand about type two diabetes and kind of the road forward, and you know what's next. Um, and I know this is outside the scope of you know your particular research, but it's just an interesting kind of talking point. And that throughout, like this was published uh, maybe a month ago, mm-hmm. um, and headed up by a number of uh, academic academics in the field of type two diabetes. And Verda Health wasn't mentioned at all huh. um which a lot of us who are interested in the field as well and and um in that academic space but also a clinical space are pretty surprised that it just sort of almost got um ghosted if you like by the uh by the huh. the researchers what's the uptake over in your neck of the woods ethan like do people you know look at those results and then are like well, that's pretty remarkable we let's see how this rolls out in other places or is it similar? Well, I guess you have to separate the question to what's the uptake of Verda and their program versus yeah. what's the uptake of using some low carbohydrate diet, some form of low carbohydrate diet. Let's just kind of narrowly to, to limit it to people with uh, with type two diabetes. Yeah, I think there's a growing awareness, somewhat based on the work from that Verda's done, but others as well, that this is a useful tool in managing mm. di- type two diabetes, and I think. Organizations such as the American Diabetes Association have begun to uh, embrace this as a, a useful tool, whereas they sort of shunned it for a long period of time. I think there are still some questions, uh, but overall, it does feel like at least here, people are beginning to accept that this is a tool in the toolbox. They're using a low yeah. carbohydrate diet approach for treating people with type 2 diabetes does appear to be useful and, and helpful if you can stick to it. Verda, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I think they're still kind of working out how they're, you know, sort of what direction their business is going to go, whether it's going to be mostly something that's uh, deployed through employers, or is it something that's going to be paid for by insurance, and, you know, all these other questions that are getting, getting tackled. But uh, they've obviously done a very good job of making it simple to have it all kind of contained within one program. I think yeah. Yeah. And did that change what you did personally, Ethan? Actually, funnily, uh, that's not a word, but uh, 
amusingly, I guess, it didn't. And I remember yeah. distinctly going to one of the very first advisory meetings that we had. It was at one of these, you know, Mexican restaurants downtown San Francisco back at a time when we actually all went out to eat. And I got there and the tables were all laid out. There were, you know, probably 20 or 30 people in the room. And they were all laid out and there were bowls. I distinctly remember there were bowls of guacamole with spoons mm-hmm. in them, but no chips. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember thinking, and I don't know what you guys call chips in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, call them but, chips. Yeah. So, and I, and then the same thing happened when they brought out the fajitas, right? There were no, um, no tortillas, and I remember thinking, like, this is kind of odd. Um, and, and you know, at that time, I had, ne- I was, I was again, I was very impressed by the data, but I wasn't doing any low carbohydrate uh, nutrition myself. Yeah. Uh, I found it all kind of strange. I came to it by totally by accident, um, and about nine months after that. Um, okay. Yeah. Do you want to describe that for me? Oh, sure. I, I, it's a story I've told a lot. I mean, I basically, uh, had somebody had dropped off a prototype for a device that allows you to measure acetone in the breath. So acetone is one of the ketones. And uh, it's, you, know, you can measure ketones a lot of different ways, through blood or breath or through urine. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was actually planning TREAT, which is this time-restricted eating study. And we were looking for ways to measure adherence to the fasting. And we thought that maybe if you fasted long enough that you would have an increase in ketones mm. and that we could use that as a marker of adherence. So I was talking to um, a scientist at a, co- you know, at a company who was developing a you know, sort of portable breath-based acetone monitor. And so we were going to use that for this treat. And I, again, I wasn't interested in it for any other reason except we were going to use it to help measure adherence for our trial. But anyway, he left it in my office and I started playing with it and, and like I picked it up and blew into it a couple of times. And I thought, well, this is kind of fun. And, and then I figured, well, I really want to see if I can get my levels to go up. So I you know, did a little bit of reading and you know, pulled out Steve's book, the, whatever it is, The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Living. And mm. um, within like four days, I was completely hooked. I basically got gamified. And I didn't ever really see myself as being overweight, but I definitely was carrying some extra pounds in my mid to late forties and uh, busy. And so all this weight started falling off of me like mm. very quickly, like within six weeks, I think I lost 15 pounds. Oh, wow. Um, and so I got hooked and that was in March of 2018. So that was a three years ago. Exactly. And I had been eating um, basically some version of that same way since then. Yeah, nice. And I imagine that, and I, I have heard you talk about this before that in your practice, as you described, this is, a useful tool in the toolbox for which you could then help support your patients with and clinically speaking Ethan do you see it as um, do you notice any differences in adherence are there a certain type of I suppose patient that might um, be more open to a lower carbohydrate approach than others or you know what what do you see in your clinic well, so let me just, before we get to that, I do want to mention that I think one of the questions that limited enthusiasm around low carbohydrate diets among, let's just say cardiologists, but you could broaden that to people, Western medicine doctors in general, mm. was the potential impact. Well, two things. One was people were, I think, a little bit uncomfortable by the amount of fat in the diet. Yeah. I think if they were nuanced, they were probably very uncomfortable with the amount of saturated fat in the diet. And then I think the other thing that sort of got people's attention was the impact in some people on increasing LDL cholesterol. Yeah. And obviously, to those of us who train cardiology, LDL cholesterol sort of is important. And yeah. uh, most of us, I think, are not prepared to kind of dismiss it as not being relevant or important to yeah. development of cardiovascular disease. So that was a, something that was always on my mind. Uh, yeah. And... So when I started thinking about this, I started thinking about it in the context of how could we develop, could we develop a program where you might get the benefits of low carbohydrate nutrition without this one potential problem? And so I guess for lack of a better word, I've been thinking about and using myself, this sort of Mediterranean stuff, you know, for, um, for myself and for my patients uh, or yeah. when I recommend it. Yeah, I um I chatted to Dr. James O'Keefe a few months ago mm-hmm. and saw his he has a paper out and basically just that that kind of pescatarian low mm-hmm. carbohydrate Mediterranean as a diet for mm-hmm. longevity. Um is that the type of approach that you're, you're yeah. kind of talking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's a very uh look, I'm not a, a super severe, you know, uh 
strict person, but I aspire to, and this is, I think, one of the principles, right? Is that I, it's there are rules, but then you can think of rules as aspirations. I don't, yeah. I don't, I think sometimes we get too caught up in, you know, it's black and white, it's yes or no. So I aspire to eat as much of my protein from plant and fish based sources. So I, yeah. I it's not that I'll never eat animal based yeah, pro- yeah. protein. It's not that I don't ever eat chicken or, uh, you know, pork or lamb, but, I, but I just eat less of it than I probably would have otherwise. Yeah. And adherence is a big thing when it comes to diet and, and people's ability to kind of stay the course, if you like, and often with a lower carbohydrate approach, I suppose one of the um, arguments against it is, oh, people can't possibly adhere. And actually it's what people say almost like, you know, like the sky is blue. So it's like, oh, well, no, no one can adhere to that without actually giving it some, I don't know, more critical thought, I suppose. Um, what do you see in your clinic? Ethan, well, that- I, yeah, so I don't see a lot of my clinic because first of all, I, I'm very careful about it, you know, so I have multiple conflicts. Uh, yeah. So I, I try not to make, to mix business, you know, yeah. to make recommendations to my patients that would ever benefit me personally, financially. So um, I am trying very careful to keep those separate, but we haven't actually published it yet. Hopefully, I don't know when this is going to come out, but there's a trial. So this company that I'm involved with called Keto, which is sort of using a this Mediterranean style low carbohydrate diet to try to uh-huh. improve weight loss. Um, we have a trial coming out that's recently completed soon. And so we've learned a lot. I don't want to talk too much about it, but I can tell you that one of the things that we've learned is that first of all, people were able to adhere. Well, they were able to lose an enormous amount of weight. They were able to adhere and they were able to adhere during, we, we enrolled this trial almost entirely. It sort of began enrollment in January of last year and we oh, finished wow. in November. So it was all during the heat of all this COVID stuff. So yeah. not only could people do it, but they could do it during a pandemic. And so I think that was one of the other things is that people will say, oh, you have to like have a specialty grocery or it's very expensive. And, uh, you know, people were able to do this and they didn't say that it was that hard. In fact, mm. they said, uh, they said quite the opposite. They said that they were, they felt like it was a relatively easy thing to stick with, which I think is a really important feature of any program, right? If you're going to, it's one thing for it to actually be hard or easy, but yeah. w- at the end of the day, what really matters is how do I th- in- interpret it. So if I if I think it's easy, even if it's super hard to somebody else, that's all that matters. Absolutely. And so people's self perception, self perceived sort of sense of how hard or difficult or difficult or easy it was 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 good. And I think that probably was part of the reason they were able to maintain, you know, to do yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, that sounds super interesting. I'm really looking forward to seeing the study when it comes out, Ethan. Because yeah. With regards to the study, which um, we're going to go into details now, which is, it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't low carb, as I understand it, it was Mm. just ad libitum diet, but it's in the same realm of that different approaches to nutrition Mm. and time restricted eating, right? Um, What sparked your interest in time restricted eating for you? Yeah, that was very easy. Uh, You know, there were these papers that came out of Sachin Panda's lab in Southern California back in 2012, 2013, that showed this incredible effect in in mice uh, right right, basically the you could take uh you know a group of mice and you could feed them the same number of calories as another group of mice and the only difference between the two groups would be that you only give mice access to food for some very narrow window of the day yeah nine hours in this case as opposed to 24 hours a day and remarkably in the mouse studies the mice ate the same exact number of calories whichever group they got into whether there was this during narrow window time or the whole 24 hour ad libitum time and yet, despite that, there was this sort of dramatic difference in weight gained in when the mice were put on these, you know, sort of so-called high-fat diets. Mm. And uh, that was very impressive. And sort of to me, at a time when I was thinking a lot about ways to give patients and people more options to do kind of relatively easy, tractable uh, interventions, this one seemed great, right? I mean, you could basically mm. eat the same amount of food, whatever you want. You didn't have to think about anything. You didn't have to measure anything. All you had to do was just narrow the window of time that you would eat during the day. Mm. So I got very interested back then. Yeah. And and did you try it personally? Is that I right? did. Sure did. Yeah. I yeah. started doing it, uh, you know, I don't know exactly 2012 or 13, but it was a while back and I thought it was great. And, you know, there was a few days where it was sort of maybe a little bit hard at the beginning. Mm. I felt a little hungry around, you know, 11 o'clock, but mm. um uh, I basically started doing it. So I would eat, I was trying to practice sort of 
16 8 fasting where i would fast from 8 p.m until noon the following day mm. and um uh, and i lost some weight and i was pretty excited about that yeah yeah and so can you kind of describe to me then ethan what was your study designed to test yeah this is important so we we made uh multiple decisions mm. this is one of the things people don't understand you, when you're going to design a study you can't do everything so mm. we knew we weren't going to be able to test we were not going to be able to do this sort of rigorous inpatient metabolic ward type studies that somebody like kevin hall does right? we weren't mm. going to be able to measure exactly what people were putting in their mouths we weren't going to be able to uh you know measure their physical activity specific you know exactly there were a lot of things we were not going to be able to do but we what we wanted to do was since the mouse data which is really all we had at that time when we were designing the study mm. they were so compelling and they really suggested that you were getting this incredible benefit for very little cost mm. meaning it was a relatively simple intervention yeah and so what we wanted to test was could people do this in the real world and what would the impact be so we decided to enroll people with overweight and obesity. So we, had, we took people who had a BMI between 27 and 43. Mm -hmm. And it was advertised as a weight loss study, but we didn't instruct anyone to restrict their calories. We didn't tell people what to eat. We mm -hmm. didn't tell them anything about um, how much to eat. We didn't tell mm -hmm. them about exercise. We just said, you can eat either during one of these three windows that we called continuous meal timing mm -hmm. um, or you can only eat during this one window which we call time restricted eating and that mm -hmm. was the intervention and so it was a very simple real world prescription so we were testing does recommending that people eat a certain way basically limiting the number of hours they eat during the day does that have an impact on their weight or metabolic health mm. and what did you find ethan we found it had no impact uh, mm. in i mean really that's the short answer but that's kind of the answer <laughs> yeah. we, we yeah. found it had absolutely no impact and yeah um you know people often ask well do you know that they were doing it and other than asking people if they were able to stick to their plan we had no other way of knowing that so yeah that's true that people would not have been able to do it but again we were motivated by this is supposed to be pretty easy to do and my personal yeah. anecdotal experience was it was relatively easy to do so we were just testing the what happens when you recommend it or prescribe it yeah and you know again people lost a little bit of weight in both arms mm -hmm. and but it was a pretty trivial amount of weight mm -hmm. and it wasn't different between the groups at the end of our uh, study which was 12 weeks yeah yeah it's interesting isn't it because you're right it's a very you know your study was very real world which is which tells us you know, I, I look at those metabolic ward studies and think they're amazing. You know, what goes into them is very rigorous and you can control everything. But because it's not real world, like how applicable is it? Like it's a great way to test a mechanism potentially. Uh, and sure. I don't know, humans, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what's going to happen when you're just talking to a, a client or a patient and saying, hey, jump on board this, you know, time restricted eating protocol. Let's see how you go. I think that's one of the reasons I've, I'm actually very good friends with Kevin Hall. And I think yeah. it's one of the reasons why he's misunderstood uh, and sometimes um, not very well liked. Because mm. I think people think that he's trying to, you know, sort of invalidate different diet approaches, including low carbohydrate diets. It's not at all mm. what he's doing. He's just trying to test, as you say, it's science. He's basically extending the laboratory experiments that were done by, you know, all of us and mice to yeah. people. And yeah, yeah. He's, he's doing these very careful experiments in people not at all trying to develop a program, not at all trying to say, you know, this is a good way or a bad way to lose weight. It's just trying to understand some of the basic physiology that I think is really, really missing. Yeah, for sure. Ethan, mycin is uh, often used as a preclinical kind of model to then translate into humans. So like, what are the differences between mice physiology and, and human physiology that might account for kind of what you guys have found? Because I often wonder that. It's such a phenomenal question. And I guess uh, I'll just answer your question two ways. One is, I think the mouse is a horrific model. And I wouldn't have said this two or three years ago. And yeah. I have a lab that employs mouse models of metabolism. So yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think the mouse is a terrible model for weight loss, nutrition, metabolism. Uh, if you're trying to use it as a way to predict what's going to happen in in human beings 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think the mouse is incredibly powerful because it allows us to test specific uh, genetic perturbations yeah. and it allows us to probe physiology and, um, and ask very specific questions about does this biochemical pathway impact, yeah. you know, is this important? Is this... But there are tremendous differences. So obviously for starters, a mouse is, you know, very tiny. Its metabolism is much faster than a human. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you fast a mouse for anything longer than two days, it'll die basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I don't mm -hmm. know the exact number, but you're not allowed to. In my university, you have to get special permission to fast a mouse for anything longer than 24 hours because it's thought to be so dangerous to the mouse. We at one point had permission to fast mice for up to 48 hours, but anything beyond that is basically you may as well just you know chop their head off. Oh, wow. um, if you calorie restrict an, a mouse for even 30% just for a week, they'll lose almost all their fat mass. So mm -hmm. there are all kinds of important differences. Some of those differences may be mediated by how we house mice and yeah. particularly the temperature at which we house them. So for reasons I think that are probably more to do with the comfort of the scientists. We house mice at a very cool temperature, so 23 or 24 degrees, mm. uh, which is not their normal you know, thermoneutral temperature. So there have been a lot of studies in the past 10 years looking at what happens when you do some of these studies at thermoneutrality, so if you do them at 30 degrees. Mm. And I think it begins to explain some of the very significant differences that we see when comparing s sort of the same experiment in mouse and people. Yeah. So if we're thinking about um, Session Panda's kind of nine hour window of, of eating, that for a mouse is equivalent potentially to, um, or that the, or if the other, if I do it the other way around, they're like 15 hours of fasting. Is that like a human well, actually, equivalent of a, like quite a bit longer? It's probably, I, don't, I haven't done the math, but others have. It's probably like a, the equivalent of a week long human fast. It's a oh, huge, man. it's a gigantic. Uh, now, mice are nocturnal and they eat most of their food during the night. Yeah. And they sleep mostly during the day, but they're great. They're eating all the time. And in yeah. the way we house them in the laboratory, they're, they have access to food all the time and you can watch them. You can watch them eat, you know, they're yeah. eating the majority of their calories at night, but they're eating plenty of stuff during the day. So yeah. absolutely. Uh, that is one core difference. Uh, the equivalent length of fast is, uh, it's like, I, like I would say, like at least a week. Yeah, yeah. And um, I've seen a lot of posts after your study was published saying, and, and media um, reports saying, well, look, time-restricted eating doesn't work. Let's go back to three meals a day. You know, what was your response to that? Okay, well, twofold. One is when we unblinded our study back last January, I did go back to eating breakfast for the first time yeah. in years. Yeah. Um, I don't exactly know what motivated that. I think I was a little bit, we haven't talked about the lean mass thing, but I think I was a little bit sort of spooked by that but also i thought gosh you know this i've been doing this for a long time and mm -hmm. i don't know let's just see what happens yeah and no, nothing's really changed i mean it's very hard to sort of assess my health from last january to now because so many other things have changed like i've yeah. been exercising more than i have in my life um yeah for other reasons so uh i think you know that was sort of for me personally i i i would not say that my interpretation is that time restricted eating doesn't work for anyone. Mm. And in fact, I'm intrigued by the possibility that maybe other forms of time restricted eating would work better. And I certainly wouldn't say that intermittent fasting can't work for anyone or anything. We didn't look at that. We looked at one very narrow form of time restricted of intermittent fasting of time restricted eating, which is the mm. 16, 8, 12 to 12 to 8 window. So mm. um, I think it's potentially still a very useful tool. I think a lot of people were understandably sort of baffled because they'd had their own personal success and they didn't understand you know how do you interpret how is this study showing that this doesn't work yeah. and again when we do studies no matter what kind of study what we're doing is we're looking at the effect the mean effect in a population in our case mm. we randomized people to two different interventions and we looked mm. at the mean effects in these two different groups individually there were people in both groups who lost a lot of weight yeah. And there were some people in both groups who gained a lot of weight. Yeah. Sort of like normal real life, actually. There you go. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So um, you, picked, you, you mentioned the lean mass, um, the result in the lean mass um, changes between the groups or within the groups. Can you just explain or describe what you found there, Ethan? 
Okay, so we had sort of a study within a study, which is we had a group of people of the 140 or so uh, overall that were in our study. A group of them, 50, I believe, were local to San Francisco. And they Mm -hmm. came in for what we called sort of intensive metabolic phenotyping. So we did all kinds of measures on them in person. The rest of the people just got a scale Mm -hmm. and an app. And they went, did their thing. And at the end of the time, they were done. Mm -hmm. You know, we would communicate with them or give them surveys and things through the app, but we didn't see them physically. Mm. And they could have been anywhere in the country. Mm. The 50 people that were local, we had them come in and we did, you know, body composition and energy expenditure. We did total energy expenditure, resting. Um, we measured all kinds of different blood markers, you know, insulin, glucose, things that are related to diabetes, lipids, everything you can think of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so in that group of people, just sort of, if you take that, and these numbers are sort of fresh because I've been giving a lot of talks recently. So in that group of people, the people randomized to time-restricted eating lost, on average, 1.6 kilograms, mm-hmm. so over 12 weeks, mm. versus the people who randomized to the CMT or continuous meal time, and they lost about three-quarters of a kilogram. So there was a, about a little less than a kilogram difference between the groups. Yeah. It wasn't quite statistically significant in this small subset, but it was close. But mm. of that 1.6 kilograms, there was a portion that was fat lost to fat. And there was a portion that was lost to what we call fat-free mass. So Mm. when you measure body composition, you're measuring fat mass using DEXA. And technically, everything else is called fat-free mass. And you can use some corrections to try to kind of establish, well, how much of that is water? How much of that is lean mass? How much of that can you even begin to estimate muscle mass? But technically speaking, you're measuring fat mass and fat-free mass. Mm. And typically in a weight loss study, if you have a kilogram of weight loss, two-thirds of a kilogram roughly or so will be lost in fat, and one third will be lost in fat-free or lean mass. Mm. What we saw in our study was the opposite. So we saw that of that 1.6 kilograms that we are on average that people lost, that 1.1 kilograms of that was fat-free mass or Mm. lean mass, and only about a half a kilogram was from fat mass. So for every kilogram of weight that people lost, they only lost about a third of a kilogram of fat mass, but they were losing two thirds of fat-free or lean mass. And we're using the DEXA scanner, we could actually identify where it looked like that lean mass was. And most of it was what we call appendicular lean mass or mass that's on your core limbs. Yeah. And so we saw a very significant decrease in, in appendicular lean mass uh, yeah. in our group. Yeah. And any potential... Um... I suppose explanations for that and why it was so particular. Like, what what did you come up with? Well, so yeah, so this was very unexpected uh, mm. and I think very so interesting. Uh, we mm. didn't design the study specifically to look at this, and I think it's going to require you know future work to really understand it. And I want to be careful to say that it doesn't mean that every form of fasting is going to lead to the same thing. Yeah, um, it doesn't mean that it's even necessarily real. Like, it has to be investigate it carefully. That yeah. said, it is interesting. And I think it's potentially interesting in a concerning way, right? You don't necessarily want to um, optimize for lean mass loss. You want to optimize for fat loss. Fat mm. loss, And especially in older people where, you know, once you get to be my age, you're not looking to find ways to lose more muscle mass. You won't yeah. want to keep it on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here are the things that we thought of. And again, none of these are tested. They're all just pure conjecture. Yeah. But we thought, well, maybe it has something to do with protein intake. So maybe yeah. there are some data, I think, suggesting that people, so I think most people on average, when they do time-restricted eating, they did it like I did, which was they would, instead of eating three meals a day, they'd eat two. Yeah. So I, I, when I did it, I would eat lunch and I'd, I'd eat dinner and I might have a little, little snack in between, but mm-hmm. I skipped breakfast. Mm-hmm. So, cause it's the easier way to do it. Now there is this sort of early time-restricted eating thing that we can talk about if we have time, but that's different. We didn't test that. Mm-hmm. So people were missing a meal. And there's some evidence, I think, to support the idea that people eat roughly the same amount of protein per meal. Mm -hmm. And so if you're cutting out a meal, you're cutting out a significant amount of protein. So one idea would be that it was just a decrease in the total amount of protein people were taking in. Mm. I think another idea that's intriguing to me is that it wasn't necessarily the amount of protein, but it was the timing of the protein, that our bodies are primed to make muscle. So we're constantly in this feudal cycle of breaking down and making new muscle. Mm. And there's some thought that maybe our bodies are primed to make more muscle in the morning, 
Yeah. Maybe there are all these hormones that are sort of circadian in their rhythms. And maybe, mm -hmm. you know, when growth hormone secretion is peaking or cortisol or other things, that that's when you'd be, your the machinery is all kind of set up to make more muscle. And mm -hmm. so maybe because we were shifting the pro protein intake to later in the day, we were kind of causing a relative decrease early in the morning when people are actually making most of the muscle. So that's one idea. Mm -hmm. I think the other possibility is that this, um, you know, is nothing to do with, with protein at all, that, it, that maybe it's, um, you know, just something about the way that this kind of, eat, you know, eating the style works. Um, and of course, then there are hundreds of other possibilities that maybe people were exercising less, or um, maybe they were exercising less in the morning, or, you yeah, know, other yeah. things, you know, so there are all kinds of potential interesting things to look at. But I, I think it's worth following up I, i'm not prepared to say like let's put a steak in time restricted eating it's dangerous you're gonna muscles gonna fall off but i think it's something that would we'd be um we'd be wise to to kind of try and figure it out yeah and like you know have you reached out to chat to session panda and or other researchers in the field to kind of get their input or their insight into what you found ethan i just i yeah. you know like is that what I you had... guys do I had a couple of um, converse, uh, conversations, but exchanges with Satch and on Twitter back when that paper came out. I think mm. it was a pretty whirlwind time, and um, you know he has invested a lot of his career in this, and I think he's doing his own studies. And so, um, look, I I want to make sure that everyone understands. I did not, we did not set out to disprove this. No. Like, I was practicing it. I was trying to, if anything we were biased towards expecting it to work. So I was very surprised yeah. that it didn't work. I understand uh, it's one study and I certainly don't want to over interpret it. I did have a couple of really nice conversations, uh, email exchanges with Courtney Peterson, who's at UAB. Mm -hmm. Courtney's a spectacular young uh, clinical science, nutrition scientist. And her sort of area of interest is early time restricted eating. Yeah. She has a study that was just presented at nutrition, uh, oh, I guess it's obesity society meetings um, back in November. Mm -hmm. And it was a relatively big, similar to ours, I think in scope, it was maybe a little bit smaller, randomized trial. And they compared people who, were, who got early time restricted eating. So in that case, they eat between sort of 6 or 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. and 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then they fast all the way through until the following day. So they're shifting, they're sort of accounting for that, you know, idea that maybe we should be eating more calories and more protein early in the day. Yeah. Um, they found, interestingly, there wasn't a, a difference in, in weight loss, uh, just, just like ours, between the two groups, but there were some interesting differences in other markers, including some body composition markers and then some markers of kind of insulin and glucose homeostasis. That study, I don't think, has actually been published yet, but mm. the abstract is available. And, and uh, I did talk to Courtney a couple of times. Yeah, I can imagine how that would feel when you, you think, oh, this will, this could be really great. You do a study, you don't find what you thought you'd find. You know, what's next for you in terms of studies um, on the base of this study, Ethan? Yeah, well, I would say there are two general areas that we're interested in. And mm. uh, one of them is to try and explore a little bit more on this lean mass thing. Mm. And that may be, you know, the flavor of those studies may be more like, you know, sort of an inpatient metabolic ward type physiology studies, just trying to understand if there is an impact on protein amount or protein timing or other things mm. on muscle synthesis, right? That would be one idea. And then the other thing I think is, okay, well, this didn't seem to work in a population of people. It wasn't the best, you know, it wasn't the most robust result, right? They didn't, people didn't lose that much weight. But maybe, you know, maybe when paired with another intervention, like let's say low carbohydrate diets, mm. maybe that would be effective. So one of the things that we'd love to do is to look at the potential interaction between not just meal timing, but also uh, what you eat. And so maybe one idea is since we have, I think, a pretty good idea that low carbohydrate diets do sort of impact less hunger when you're mm. calorie restricted, mm. that maybe that would, in those people, you, they would be more prone to tolerate fasting as an intervention mm. and so yeah. i'm curious about looking at that interaction yeah do you see that at all in your clinic like do people who you work with do they kind of follow time restricted eating protocols as their um preferred method and and what's your kind of clinical experience in this outside of your personal experience 
I, yeah, look, so this goes back right when I was starting to kind of get interested in it myself and I would talk to friends and family and occasionally some patients and would recommend it again because it seemed like it was harmless mm. potentially mm. and relatively easy to do. So I got very excited and, you know, people would ask what I was up to and I was telling them about the study we were doing. And the great thing about nutrition is that you don't need a doctor or a prescription or anything to uh, permit you to do what you want to put in your body. You can yeah. do whatever you want. So people can go off and do their own N of one experiments any day, every day. And so a lot of people did. Uh, I am now very cautious about interpreting the anecdotal N of one responses of anyone because there are lots of ways to lose weight. Yeah. And as I said, even in our study, lots of people lost weight with both interventions. So mm. I do think, you know, living in San Francisco, there is a culture here that seems to be enamored with fasting. I had somebody told me a funny story once. So one of my patients fast, I mean, my patients have a very funny practice. They have very funny fasting practices. Some of them fast for very long periods of time. But, but one of them was telling me that he only eats, you know, like two days a week or something. Mm. And, that, um, and that often he would find himself at dinner with a group of people for work. And that like six of the eight people at the table would just be drinking water. <laughs> like it was, yeah. it was like, wow. Yeah. 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 Pretty wild. Um, yeah. There are some, uh, yeah, there are some really interesting things that people are doing. I, t- I have one, I love telling this story, but I have one patient of mine who, I don't know how many times he does it a year, but a couple times a year, he'll do a two-week fast. And so he'll, he'll fast for one whole week. And on Sunday, so he'll go start fasting on Sunday. And on the first Sunday, he'll break the fast with a steak and a glass of red wine. And then oh. he'll fast again the following one more week. Just oh, having wow. had that one glass of wine, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's not a bad way to break a fast, really. Um, no, it's a great way. Yeah. yeah, but it is interesting, isn't it? So, you know, I um, teach nutrition and we talk about, you know, the social kind of constructs of eating and, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner has sort of been decided by society rather than we've evolved to eat three meals a day. But it's it's been so kind of ingrained that it is unusual if you go to dinner and you're not going to eat you know it's one of those oh that's a bit weird whereas low carbohydrate approaches now are much a much more mainstream if you like and it's generally you know if you don't eat bread or if you get a burger right. without the bun i mean people or restaurants now offer that rather than that you're sort of you know thinking outside the square a little bit i think that's right i think people are now there's enough especially in the past 10 years there's been enough kind of unusual i hate using that word because it feels pejorative but there are plenty of people who are vegans or vegetarians or gluten-free or whatever it is so i think restaurants are now comfortable i mean i've never had a problem going out to eat um yeah even at a pizza restaurant you can sort of figure out what you're going to eat um Mm. you'll find something uh so i i think you're right whereas and that was part of the reason why when we designed our study we didn't design it to be this early time restricted window because we felt like dinner was such a social meal in Western Mm. culture that Mm. it would be awkward for me to come home from work and sit down with my family while they were eating dinner and I would have a glass of water. Yeah. Whereas breakfast is, you know, I don't remember the last time we ate breakfast together as a family. It probably never happened. And so it felt like if you were going to miss a meal, that would be the one to miss. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. Or maybe like lunch. Except it doesn't work. The math doesn't work. Yeah. You can't skip lunch and fast for anything longer than eight hours or whatever it is, right between breakfast and dinner. Yeah, you're right. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it makes we it thought about difficult. it. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that lunch is definitely not a social. I mean, I eat lunch by myself most days, and no yeah, one would yeah. ever notice. Yeah. But it doesn't work now. There are some people who do this one meal a day thing, mm. and they'll eat just you know. And again, if you were just going to eat one meal, it'd probably be dinner because it's the one that people tend to eat together. Yeah. But then there's the sort of physiology that maybe that's not the right time to be eating. Maybe yeah. maybe you should be eating if you're having one meal. Anyway, I do think one thing, one thing that sort of when I got into fasting, I did, it did occur to me, there were a couple of things that I thought were interesting. One was hunger is um, perceived to be, and maybe it's almost conditioned to be, assumed to be linear. That is that yeah. we, I think... You know, you get a little bit hungry and you think that's just going to keep going up, 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 up. But as anyone who's fasted for any length of time knows that there are going to be dips and valleys and stuff mm. that people actually go through periods of time where they feel hunger, but then the hunger goes away. And then after a long, long fast, people say that their hunger is, you know, very, very su- substantially much lower. Mm. So that was one thing. The other thing is I think we've conditioned our 
well, I'll speak for myself. I, I think we conditioned our children to eat pretty much during all waking hours. I think the yeah. people have looked at sort of what amount of time do people eat. If the average person is awake for 16 hours a day, I think people are eating for 14 hours or plus of those of the, mm. of the day. It's really amazing. And that's partly because there's so much availability of, you know, sort of very palatable, calorie dense food that's just here all, all you know in a refrigerator in a cabinet or in a bureau or whatever it is there's uh, or a vending machine there's just all over the place so mm. that was one thing i'd say that i took away from my early thinkings about this was that maybe we should be eating really when we're hungry um, and not necessarily when somebody says it's the right time yeah it's so hard isn't it like i um yeah the, yeah people get up and they commute to work and they grab a latte and a you know something quick to eat and then at the other end of the day they're sitting down with a cup of tea and a couple of biscuits and that's like over that 15 hour period so even that almost 12 hour window from seven till seven as a an approach to kind of eating is almost foreign for some people but they i feel as well people don't necessarily recognize that because they don't really stop and think about what they're doing mm. with food but when you get them to go right 12 and 12 they're like oh, oh that's easy ah that means I have to change the timing of my latte and I have yeah. to cut out eating earlier in the evening time yeah well and the other thing that we thought going into this trial I mean I was convinced this was going to work mm. and one of the other reasons we were so excited was we figured well breakfast is this like funny meal in the west where People are eating these incredibly processed and highly high carbohydrate meals, right? So mm. a latte and a scone or a muffin or a bagel um, and, or a cereal, you know, whatever that is that people are. So maybe one of the benefits would be just getting rid of all of that. Like yeah. even if it's, it has nothing to do with the amount of time that you're not eating, it's just getting rid of that, you know, crap that people are putting in their mouth. So we were mm. excited that that would be another potential benefit of this way of eating, but it didn't look that way. So was there was it n any differences between the calorie intake between those people who ate within that eight hour window and those at, at libitum? We didn't measure it. And uh, partly we didn't measure it because I sort of was led to believe, and I think, you know, again, this is complicated, but I was led to believe mm. that the metrics, the tools that we use, the instruments to measure uh, calorie intake in free living people are very inaccurate. And, uh, oh, yeah. it, and so we sort of figured, well, why are we going to go through all this hassle and put people through yeah. the hassle of you know having to do these you know surveys and other things if they're not even going to be accurate? Yeah. But the truth is that we actually intended to do them. We just couldn't get there was a tech glitch, and so they never got delivered. Um, yeah. So yeah. we don't know what people eat. Yeah, and and really, it doesn't necessarily matter because you know you you measured compliance. You know that most of the people, well, was it I think eighty three percent of people kind of said that they complied with the recommendation and, and it was actually quite easy to see okay does it work or doesn't does it work or doesn't it work well it didn't appear to work in your study so that's quite a nice sort of simple thing to be able to come away from it not necessarily the result that people expected or wanted to find but that's right. a result nonetheless it was exactly right you just hit the nail on the head it was not the result that people expected or wanted to find and i would include in that people group me yeah 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 so ethan with your next trial or in this area you're um just thinking about different ways to kind of approach it would you consider looking at the addition of resistance training or anything that might offset potentially that loss of muscle mass sure i guess i'm going to answer your question twice one cool. is absolutely if you want to pretend, i think there are lots of ways to explore offsetting that loss in lean mass mm. if it's real one of them you know like i said varying the timing or quantity of protein changing exercise patterns asking mm. people to do more resistance training there are all kinds of ways we should all understand how that works mm. but at the end of the day that's a lot to go through for a half a kilogram of fat loss right i mean yeah. it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's it doesn't to me feel like we've unlocked the magic to weight loss with this intervention now yeah, maybe yeah. people will do it a different way and find something else. But the way we did this thing, it sort of felt like, gosh, yeah, we can probably fix the wart, the problem with this one, but for what end? Like yeah. nothing else changed. You know, we yeah. measured 5,000 things and nothing else changed. Yeah, so it yeah. didn't look like it was 
there was a great problem to solve here for us. Yeah. Yeah, no, fair enough. And so with your next study, a potential for the interaction between low carb and time restricted eating, what's the timeline on something like that? Well, we'll start off with something modest, like six months, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. to see what happens. It, it, we did 12 weeks with this one as a pilot. If there had been a difference, it would have been just a pilot. We would have had to then demonstrate that there was actually some ability for people to maintain that over. Yeah. You know anything longer than just 12 weeks but we felt yeah. like 12 weeks was adequate to be able to see if there was going to be a difference yeah but we'll, we'll do 12 but we'll do a six months for the interaction study yeah yeah that sounds yeah well that will be something to look forward to and as well as the other study that you've mentioned at the start of our call yeah. that is just about to be published that sounds like an exciting um kind of area to look at yeah it's fun because you know these studies were sort of just following one another. One of them, I was the PI on. One of them, I'm a sort of, I guess, ostensibly the sponsor because I'm involved with a company that, yeah. you know, sponsored the trial and the trial is being done by academic collaborators in British Columbia. Actually, Jonathan Little, who's a spectacular young uh, nutrition scientist, mm -hmm. is the PI on that study. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't want to give too much away, but the, it was interesting to look at the differences between, the studies were actually very similar in size and duration. It was very interesting to look at the differences in the results. I mean, uh, it, after treat where we saw very little <laughs> happen yeah. we actually saw a lot happen in this other study so it's actually kind of fun to kind of see one that where things actually happen yeah yeah things the, the needle has moved somewhat it moved yeah but it's a it'll be a really fun exciting um story and i actually think there's a lot to talk about like there's going to be some really interesting conversations that come up around this study and uh, and i love that like i love that people get you know sort of get interested in wanting to kind of weigh in and think about different things we don't have all, all the answers in fact we don't even have a lot of answers but i think yeah. we're going to ask some great questions like we'll actually our study i think does raise some really interesting questions yeah um, oh well so, that sounds awesome yeah. ethan and i'm really looking forward to seeing the paper and then being able to you know actually look at the detail around it and what you did what you found and i know you can't give too much away right now but um it's always good to have something to look forward to. Yeah, this will be fun. It'll be fun. We'll, uh, mm. we'll, we'll maybe uh, we'll have to have another conversation the next. Or you should talk to John. Actually, he's the PI. So. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ethan, thank you so much for your time this morning. And I feel like getting kind of your um, and I know you've done a number of interviews now, and it was you know I I really appreciate that you came on to talk to me about it, and just people appreciate that. I suppose this is not the nail in the coffin and it might not even be the nail in the coffin for the, you know, it will for any kind of aspect of it, but it's unusual for people to get excited about a null result in a study. So, uh, but with something like nutrition, time restricted eating, it's a bit almost like a nutrition's like a religion, right? So it is. if you don't see that result you want, then you're much more likely to get a little bit um, upset by it. So they'll be happy with regards to kind of your take on it and, you know, your perspective and kind of your next steps, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, once a while ago, Dylan Lowe, who's the graduate student who did all this work, mm. uh, did a Google search for intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating books. It was, it was probably a few years ago. And there, I mean, there are hundreds of them. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of people out there selling this idea and I'm just glad, look, this is like you say, it's not the nail in the coffin at all. It's just one piece of information. Mm. Um, and, but it's important because people should know what they're getting into. Absolutely. And it was, you know, a study done in humans, done the way that we might talk to people about how you might do intermittent fasting and how it's potentially beneficial, which wasn't what you found. But hey, there may be other ways That's to right. spin it as well. Ethan, thanks for your time this morning. Um, of I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Lovely. Enjoy your day. Thank you very much. All right, team. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Weiss. Super generous with his time. And I'm really excited to see sort of what these next studies, how they inform our understanding about time-restricted eating. And next week on the show, I bring to you my super fun chat that I had with Brody Kane. Now, Brody is well known in our circles as being a bit of a, you know, a media chick. And she's breakfast radio, she's 
news television, and now she is her own entity, Brody Kane Media. And so we talk all about sort of how COVID threw a spanner in the works with regards to uh, where she was at in her career, but how she's really made the most of that. Until next week, though, you can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at Mickey Willardin on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition and over on my website MickeyWillardin.com where you can book a consultation, sign up to one of my meal plans which is pretty much there is something there for almost everyone which gives you a 28 day meal plan or a fixed term plan for fat loss or longevity. You get my weekly emails and you get access to help me help you individualize that plan. Otherwise, if you just want to hear a little bit more from me, why don't you head to my website, put your name in the little pop-up box and your email there as well, and then you'll get my weekly email and you'll start getting a little bit of what I'm researching and what I'm thinking about on a weekly basis. Until then team, if you enjoyed this podcast and you think you know others that might as well, head over to your favorite podcast platform, hit subscribe, that would be amazing, share it with your mates, that is also great. And uh, we'll see you next week. See ya.